to the History Slam podcast from ActiveHistory.ca. Here's your host, Sean Graham. Thank you, Adam. Welcome to the History Slam, everybody. I am Sean Graham coming at you today nearly live from Ottawa, Ontario, still in the midst of the global pandemic. And one of the things that has come out of the pandemic is a greater recognition of those in the healthcare industry not only here in Canada, but around the world, we've seen a greater appreciation for the work that these people do, whether it's people heading out to balconies and and applauding, banging pots and pans, seeing some digital thank you projects that people have done. It's just nice to have these moments to not only be appreciative of people who serve, but also just to remind ourselves in a time when social media and just media in general is focusing on negative things. And, and certainly there is negative negativity within a global pandemic, obviously, but just in the motivations of individuals, whether it's you know political or social, we've, we've seen individuals act in ways that are not always in the greatest of spirits over the past few months. And it's nice to have these moments where we can focus on those people who are there to help others. And certainly nurses, doctors are part of that. And we have a new book that has recently come out that is well-timed to this moment to reflect on those people who serve others. The book is When Days Are Long, Nurse in the North. It's by Amy Wilson. And Amy Wilson was a nurse from Alberta who in 1949 went to Northern British Columbia and Yukon and served indigenous communities in the North and traveled throughout the region providing health care, but also listening and engaging with communities to provide support for them as much as they could. And she really turned into an advocate for these communities and was upset and shocked by some of the treatment that they were receiving from the federal government. And in 1965, she published a book entitled No Man Stands Alone that was about her experiences and trying to provide a window to the rest of the country into what life was really like in the North for so many of these communities. And that book has been republished as When Days Are Long. It really is timely in this moment. And not only does it document Amy Wilson's experience, but it also, when you go through it, kind of shows how little progress has been made in some of these areas in terms of government and the way in which communities are served. And it's a wonderful read and very illuminating and engaging. You get a lot of Amy Wilson's personality in it. And I was very lucky to have the opportunity to speak with her grandniece, Laurel Diedrich Maine, who was instrumental in bringing this book back. She wrote the introduction for it. She really is very passionate, as you'll hear about the story, and engaging with a lot of the material that Amy created. So I had the pleasure to speak from her earlier today. So without any further ado, here's my conversation with Laurel Diedrich Maine. And I'm happy to welcome in Laurel Diedrich Maine, all the way from Edmonton. Laurel, how are you this morning? I'm well, thank you. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, very excited to talk about this book and talk about your aunt. Amy, uh, very timely that this is coming out now. Uh, Obviously, the circumstances of that timeliness, no one's really happy about, but it is uh, it it is a timely book. But before we get into some of the specifics of of how this all came about, let's talk about Amy and and who she was. And obviously, a a member of your family, you're her great grandniece, great grandniece or just grandniece? I think grandniece is the proper term. Okay. Great niece. I'll be a great niece. You'd be, yeah, wow. why not? Yeah, let's yeah, let's add more more adjectives, right? It's never never yeah. wrong to do that. So, uh, f- for you and your family, you know, who who was Amy, and and how do you remember her? Um, Amy 
was, so she was my great aunt, which means that she was my father's aunt. And um, she was one of seven children uh, born to a farm family in Alberta. And her mother died when she was very young. She watched her mother die um, after the birth of the seventh child. Um, my great-grandmother never recovered and um, over a period of months just slowly died. At that time, Amy was, I think, about four. And um, so my father's mom, the eldest daughter in that family, I know it gets very confusing, <laughs> but she ended up having to raise the children along with um, her dad. In those days, sometimes if a mother died fathers would, um, particularly if they had a lot of kids and a working farm, they would right away remarry, or children were divvied up among other families, either relatives or not, uh, to make the load a little easier. But one of the um, tales of the family lore was that on her deathbed, my great-grandmother made my great-grandfather promise that he would not separate the children. So along with my grandma, um, who was 13 at the time, raised these children, these seven children. And uh, Amy was one of them. And it was also a time when, um, you know, people were susceptible to various diseases that would come through a community. In her case, it was smallpox, um, other childhood diseases. And as a family, they protected each other. As a family, they took care of each other. Um, so I think that spirit of caretaking was something that was just embedded in, in how that family survived. Was there any indicate, or was there a tradition within the family of healthcare, of wanting to get into healthcare? It, you know, we talked before that, you know, you and your family very involved in the arts out there in Alberta, but in general, it, is this a family uh, tradition of people getting involved within the health industry? Well, I think at the time, and it's just, uh, this would be the same across the board, there weren't many job opportunities for women. And uh, I think my great-grandfather was quite forward-thinking and was not opposed to his daughters having uh, careers and vocations, I mean, aside from the daughter that raised the kids. But the other daughters were encouraged to um, have some kind of vocation. And at that time, your choices really for women were basically nursing or teaching. And um, so another older sister of Amy's was a nurse. Another older sister was a teacher. Now, she tried teaching. She went to normal school in Calgary, and I don't know if she lasted more than a year before she came back and said, I don't want to do this. I want to be a nurse. And, you know, then the family resources were pooled again to support her in her nursing education, and that's where she really uh, found her, her place. Mm -hmm. So, you know, whether it was just embedded in the family, I don't know. It was just that was the choices that were available to women. Yeah, and certainly that is a big part of it, right? The, at this time, particularly in that part of the country, yeah, fewer opportunities for women to get involved in, in the economy in, in ways other than the sort of gendered professions that, that were established. And, and I think nursing is really interesting at this time, you know, you're looking at coming out of the after the First World War, there was this increased professionalization of nursing that just continues through the 20s, 30s, and then obviously during the Second World War as well. And, and when you look at Amy's life, and, and I'm curious what you think of this, do you view her or does the family view her as almost like a, a, a trailblazer of sorts, as, as someone who was not only getting involved in nursing in this way, but as we'll talk about her decision as to where to be a professional and, and where to go, you know, how does the family view her in, in the totality of what she did, given the, the wider social circumstances of the time? Oh, I think that they, they saw her as absolutely like, like a heroine. They saw her as, you think your word was a trailblazer. Um, they, because of where they were located, they hadn't really had any contact with Indigenous communities, particularly um, 
at, at, during their, their growing up at that time and that she would make a choice to um, work in those communities, to work in the north. Uh, I think that everybody was always kind of awestruck by her choices. Um, and they were also kind of awestruck because of just her general personality, which was one of um, a very, she was a very cheery person. That's not a word we hear very often anymore, but she was a very cheery person and an optimistic person and a very entertaining uh, personality. And um, so, yeah, I think they always kind of looked upon her, and certainly the family lore continues around, you know, that Aunt Amy, boy, she was a real brick. She was a real, you know, she was a real gal. Um, another one of those words we don't use often enough, but she was a swell gal. Right. Yeah. I like that word cheery, too. That's something you want in a nurse, right? If you go into a hospital, you want a nurse who has a good disposition, who's positive, who's happy all the time, even in sort of bad circumstances you know when you when you're there if you're in pain whatever having somebody who's cheery can be helpful so it is a good disposition to have if you're going into nursing it is yeah well and i think we see that now too you know that um boy everybody wants to side with the person who gives you a little ray of hope or a little ray of sunshine and yeah. i think she was like that yeah so do do you know what it was that drew her north and why she wanted to head up into northern British Columbia and into the Yukon. As you said, you know, the, the family hadn't had a lot of experience with Indigenous people. So what was it in your mind that really drew her to that part of the country? Well, so I have two, there's two, uh, two roads into my answering that question. One is sort of based on uh, reality and one is sort of based on speculation that has become more substantiated as um, as we've uncovered more of her private life through her letters and so on. But the first one was at that point, uh, the, the country was in a depression, and so she would take the first job that she could. She knew that she didn't want to do city nursing. Uh, she was not the starchy hospital type. Um, you know, little white shoes and a crisp uh, cap were not her kind of thing. Um, and so she wanted to do rural nursing. She wanted to be out of the city. So when an opportunity came to work in, um, at that time it was northern Alberta. Well, still is northern Alberta, but that's where she started out. Um, then she took that job. So that's a fact. The other thing about Amy that we have come to know is that she was, um, she was lesbian at a time when socially um, to be atypical, I guess, would would not have found um, favor or, or acceptance, or maybe she feared it, it would be so. Um, to, to be in a smaller community, to be more of a, a uh, what's the word I want here? I'm really grappling, but um, she, she was, she was an outsider in mm-hmm. in a way, and um, and to say you know to announce with you know she was a lesbian. Well, I, I don't mean to say that in a way that is judgmental or meant to be provocative. I think she just was more comfortable not having to um, work in an environment where she would be expected. To answer questions about, gee, why aren't you married, or why aren't you going out with a fellow, or you know, um, she was more comfortable just working alone. Um, I don't know if I'm making any sense. No, no, I, no, you are. I, I think that makes a lot of sense, and we've seen it in other stories, and I've come across it in other stories that that I've read of people who are or were members of, of the LGBTQ plus community who for a variety of reasons, uh, chose paths that would allow them to hide their personal lives so that they wouldn't have to confront a, a society that was not accepting of that. And going north in, a, in an isolated environment 
that is a way to isolate yourself from those questions as well. You know, we, we've also seen cases of people who move from rural communities to cities in an effort to try to find people who are like them and, and to find a community in that way. And, and I, I think it makes a lot of sense that when you are struggling in if she was or, or coming to terms or, or accepting or, or whatever whatever way you want to phrase it as you're doing that everyone's going to react differently and there's nothing wrong with either way if this was her way of avoiding the speculation from family members in the community so that she could yeah. find some happiness I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that and as you say i don't think there's a it's provocative to say that it's just this is how she, or this is part of her uh, process of 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 obviously not necessarily coming out, but of of creating an environment in which she could find some happiness. Yes, where she could be herself, and I think yeah. you articulated it way better than me <laughs> because you know it's not um, even like she was was seeking any kind of relationship. It's a place where she could just do her work and not be uh, subjected to any questions about her personal life. And yeah, um, you're outside the peering works. eyes of others. Yeah. 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 And that's a good, and that's a, you know what I will say just in general, that could be a good thing, right? When you can just live your life. Exactly. Then that's how it ought to be. Um, you know, everybody should be allowed to live their life yeah. and and without judgment. And you know, we could we could have another hour long conversation <laughs> on that topic. Um, but yeah, you know, in in the 30s, 40s, uh, when she was a, a young nurse, this this was a um, if not even a conscious choice, it was uh, a safe choice for her to to like you say, put herself into a place of of more isolation in community. Um, rather than among the peering eyes of, of others. So, yeah. And, you know, going north is, is of course, has the other elements, as, as you mentioned earlier, sort of the, she's working with indigenous communities. And I am curious about this part of it, because you mentioned that the family didn't have a lot of interaction with indigenous peoples prior to her going north. What do you know about that side of it and, and her relationship with the communities once she gets there, her her process of understanding, you know, the, the culture that she encounters, the the day to day life that is going to be very different from what she grew up in? What, what was her her sort of process through which she got to know the people in the, in the community once she got there? Well, you know, as far as I can understand, and again, this is Going, going through all of the, the banker's boxes of um, her material that has been left to me, she really um, appreciated the, the structure within those communities of how family took care of family, and that was not unfamiliar to her. Um, she recognized, I think, that the, that the community uh, raised, uh, children and that there was a lot of support for one another and I think she really responded to that she really appreciated that it wasn't um, yes every community would have their chief they would have their medicine people or persons um, but there was um, a, a, a way that the community functioned that I think she found comforting in a way, and um, if I could jump all the way to um, like the first chapter in her book, which is called Epidemic, um, but the reason there was this outbreak in this community was because as a, as a group, when one person got sick, they decided not to leave their summer camp, that that person was too sick to move, so they were all going to stay right. and care for this person. So I think that she responded to that kind of community or familial loyalty and care. And I think she responded very much at a heart level to how people took care of one another. And she respected their efforts. She respected their traditions um, and was curious. And so... Um, 
yeah, I think it just was opening a whole new world to her. She wasn't necessarily trying to impose all of her white ways and traditional white education upon these communities of lesser than people. Instead, she was admiring of what they had as their own resources and how they um, chose to take care of one another. So I think that's kind of where where her um, interest was taking her. Yeah, and, and I think it sort of comes out through through the book as well that when she first gets there, she's met with I don't know if resistance is is the right word, but certainly some some skepticism of you know as she's traveling through uh, with an X-ray machine. You know, the the book talks about how she comes into community because she's dealing in a, in a like for like half a million square kilometer space, so there's a huge yeah. space that she's covering, and she's coming to communities and people are are skeptical of of what are you here for um if if somebody yeah. is sick and they have to be taken away uh, to edmonton for treatment what does that mean for the rest of us as you talked about that community uh, environment that community spirit so she's she has to deal with the the realities of what life is there and as you say the importance of not imposing a perspective or or anything on these communities that's part of being an effective nurse and, and helping improve the health care of individuals without imposing upon them certain ways of thinking and ways of doing and you know in, in going through the book it strikes me at least that you know, getting back to her disposition that she had the per perfect disposition to be able to do this in an effective manner and build relationships with the people who she was meeting. Yes, I think she was all about relationship building, um, and she was good at it. Again, that goes back to her cheery disposition. Um, but, uh, yeah, she was met with skepticism, and, and rightly so, yeah. right? I mean, for yeah. <laughs> she didn't speak the language. There's, there's, you know, multiple, multiple languages up there. So she would have to be communicating through, you know, someone who, um, you know, usually that usually the chief would speak a little English and so on. But you know, she had to win over the hearts and minds of of people. And so she, I think she just had that real skill through her disposition, through her um, meeting people where they were at. Um, that she gained their their trust, but it was hard. It was hard for her, I think, um, because if I may go off on another one of my little Irish tangents here, um, you know, it, she understood sometimes that their skepticism was really, really well warranted, and it didn't make sense to her either. You were talking about the TB. Um, x-ray survey that they were, you know, going through with this big machine and so on, and sometimes a person would have to be, often would have to be sent out to Edmonton, which was the nearest big um, hospital, but she really advocated for a hospital in the region. She understood that the, the, the white ways of a southern hospital were not conducive to the wellness on um, uh, of, of people. They may on a physical level, but not on an emotional and social level. And she would write to her bosses in Ottawa saying, here's an empty building in Whitehorse. Surely that could be made into a facility where people could um, convalesce. And, you know, she, she really tried to bring the, the, the services to the people in their regions rather than sending people out. So she was, um, she was conflicted. And, you know, if they were, if they were skeptical, I think she was too about, you know, just where, where people should be treated. Yeah. And certainly one of the scariest things just in general, right. But certainly at, at that time in that place is to say, Hey, I'm from the government of Canada. I'm here to help you. Right. That's <sighs> right. That That's, uh, yeah. you know, and, I say this all the time, and, and sort of for full disclosure, I do work for Parks Canada as a historian. And one of the things that we, we talk about frequently is if there is skepticism of the federal government, why? Right? Don't we? It, it's very important not to just scoff off skepticism, be like, oh, these people don't understand what we're trying to do. 
Well, let's try to understand what their perspective is, because in, in a lot of cases, it, it's warranted and it's based off of a long time of broken agreements and, and they're, they're, the distrust is well warranted. So that's part of a, a process. And, and it's it's interesting that Amy really recognizes this in the moment and is advocating and, and as, as you say, turns from you know healthcare provider to healthcare provider slash advocate. I know, and that's one of the most admirable things about her, I think, among among many things. But that, I, you know, I don't think she went in there like a, oh, I'm going to be an advocate for these people. I don't really know anything about them, but I know this is a virtuous thing to do. No, it's like she got to know them. She got to understand them. She listened to them. And it was from that place of um, her being open-hearted that yeah, yes, she worked for the government, but mostly she worked, I think she felt really she worked for the people. She, I, hmm. I, Again, I'm speculating, but if I had her at the table to interview, I'd say, who do you think you're, interv- who do you think you're um, caring for, Amy? Who are you responsible to? And she would say, I'm responsible to these people, not I'm responsible to my, you know, federal government. Right, right. And, and I, I wonder, too, in terms of being that advocate, uh, obviously, this book is, is has come out recently, but it's a it's another edition of a book that was an, originally published in 1965 as No Man Stands Alone. And I'm curious yeah. if you think her writing as she was there, what her experiences were in creating this, do you think that this was part, even unconsciously, of that? role of her as an advocate of trying to tell these stories and that this was another way for her to care for the people and, and give them a voice? Hmm. I, I think maybe, again, I don't think it would have been on a necessarily a real conscious level. Her, I will say this, her, her plan was to, to write two books. So, so the first one, um, No Man Stands Alone, which was, it was a very good title, um, at the time, so is the so is the new one that that we've made. But um, you know, she she wanted to shine a light on what was happening at the time in the region. And her second book was going to go deeper into um, what the needs in these communities were, and also leading into how as a as a country we were um failing the people of the north um and she unfortunately died uh just weeks after her book came out in 1965 she was fairly young and i can talk a little more about her death in a while but um you know yeah i think she wanted to first of all quite gently in her fairly cheerful manner um just shine a light on on what it was like for people living in the north. You know, the Alaska Highway had only just opened up, and when we say highway, that's kind of being um, generous. It was, you know, dirt, mud, ice roads. It wasn't like there was the big, um, you know, sort of tourism opportunity into the north at that time that, you know, people didn't know. So, um, and it's not like there were film crews flying here, there, and everywhere. So her words really were just giving... um, people from outside a look at what it was like up there yeah and part of what's interesting about that to me is not only is she opening up this window for for people in other parts of the country to to get a sense of of what's going on there but it also shows how difficult it was for her to do her job you know you you talk about the highway and, and how difficult it was to travel i mean her job was or entailed traveling throughout this large area uh, without really the the way to do it in a super efficient manner. So the physical and mental toll that that would take and uh, in, in doing that just constantly, that sort of is, is part of the story as well of her trying to not only you know, be a nurse while also you know, advocating, but also just trying to, I don't know if survive is too strong of a, a word, or maybe thrive in an environment in which the conditions for her to travel 
and to treat people are not ideal, and that's that's part of what this story is. Yes, it really. You know, it, it wouldn't maybe be stretching it to say it's a story of of survival. It, you know, that I mean, she at any time she could have frozen to death herself practically <laughs> or there could have been an accident where mm-hmm. she's you know she could have fallen into the river when they're going on that funny little bridge by a pulley uh over the rushing waters of, of the mighty kluani i guess it is and um you know just the the snowshoeing from you know the their first camp where she set up four miles uh in an old abandoned trading post I think it was an old abandoned shack anyway she's there and having to snowshoe four miles a day into the camp where they were stricken with diphtheria or you know she's um uh yeah traveling over difficult roads and the thing is when people were sick they weren't brought to her they were rarely brought to her she was stationed in White Horse. She got a message, and she went out to them. And like you said, the the territory, her district was what is it, two hundred thousand square miles or something? It, it you know, it, it's the yeah. entire Yukon territory was her district, and she's traveling by whatever means she needs to to get there. And um, yeah, not like oh yeah, bring that patient in. So she depended on on bush pilots she depended on various guides to to get her places but she was again nursing people where they were at rather than you know uh, having them come to her so yeah survival i think that's fair enough and and what role do you think that had or what effect do you think that had on her overall health you you talked that she she dies young uh, she dies of heart disease uh, when she's only 57 years old. Is there a connection that can be made between the challenges of the the profession and and the job that she had, and the 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 fact that she died quite young? I think there's a connection for sure. And you know, I think I had mentioned earlier that um, she had scarlet fever as a child, and one of the one of the um, side effects of scarlet fever is that it can weaken the heart. So this was her, um, the, the outcome of her having survived scarlet fever was that she had a weak heart, but she didn't tell anybody that. And, um, and she didn't stop, let, let, she didn't let that stop her from all of the physical demands of the job. And I think her sheer will, her sheer love of the work and the people and the environment kept her going. I think that actually um, supported her heart. And I and I say that sort of from my own understanding as a massage therapist too. There's a whole psycho-emotional um, aspect to our physical strengths. And I think her, her love of the people and the environment, like I said, um, gave her the strength of heart to do the work. However, over time, when her appeals to the government for more support for the people, when those appeals were falling on deaf ears, when there was a you know a, a change in the department or whatever, and um, she began to feel um, this perfect word for it disheartened. I think her strength began to wane. And and you know from having read the book, there are so many situations that are actually heartbreaking. Yeah. And how she would do her level best in every one of those situations to, um, you know, provide care and service and... Um, I think it just all began to take a toll. And yeah, I I think as much as she died from the, you know, the physical reality of having a weak heart from her own childhood disease, she also died from what, you know, we sort of say in the vernacular that broken heart syndrome. Yeah. 
um, and I don't think that's a I don't think that's a stretch. I don't think that's a oh, cosmic massage bunny uh, a comment on um, holistic health. It's just we can't separate the psycho emotional from the physical. And in her case, she just wore out. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that's something that you know we've seen that idea with other people too. I think that most famously with Jackie Robinson and everything that that he went through in his life. He died very young as well, and and sort of there was the sense that you know just living that stressful life, always having to to sort of confront these negative situations and being bombarded with it, that takes its toll physically. Even even though you know we talk so much about mental health, but. I think increasingly there is the recognition, widespread recognition of the connection between the two, that mental health and physical health are really one and the same. And you, know, you, you have to be healthy in all aspects of your life. Yeah. And yeah. we're, and we're hearing these, um, these words now in our, in our own um, time of the pandemic, yeah. uh, the connection between physical and mental health. So um, yeah, I think, and that, and that's sort of why I wanted to bring. Well, not that I knew a pandemic was coming, but why I felt like re-releasing the book now um, was also uh, relevant mm -hmm. um, for a number of reasons. I mean, for Indigenous issues um, and and Indigenous health, and also, um, yeah, just all the all the things that Amy represented and did then have have uh, currency in today's world. Yeah, so the book initially comes out 1965 called No Man Stands Alone and well received. It, it does well at the time. You know, people read it. As you mentioned, she dies. And I, I'm curious, you know, why you sort of got into it a little bit, but what was the process of bringing it back in in this era right now? And, and what was the impetus? What was the moment in which you decided that, you know, the time was right to do it? Um, you know, it's funny. I've been sitting with it for about 10 years, just it, always in the back of my mind. I mean, I have, I have a novel out, and even while I was working on that novel, there's just a little um, uh, mention of the Alaska Highway, and I got thinking back about Aunt Amy and got thinking about her work, and I knew that that was going to be the next thing that I wanted, wanted to do, that I felt um, that there's, and, and this is at the same time as, you know, the, the Truth and Reconciliation Report was being, um, that whole um, process was happening while I was putting my novel out. And I thought, you know, there were what we would, the word we use is allies, right? There, there were allies of Indigenous people um, going back in our, in our history. And it is uh, maybe a good time to shine a light on someone who could set an example of, of, of how to um, live, respect, love, support um, Indigenous people. So that's kind of what the impetus was. Um, yeah, and I just, you know, and, and, I, and I sort of shopped the idea around and, and found a publisher that was, that was uh, willing to get on board with it. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, and I'm curious too, as part of that, the change in title, right? So in 1965, t comes out as "No Man Stands Alone." Now, when days are long, as you mentioned, both are reflective of what's in the book. But how did you come to the the title? And I'm, I'm assuming that the change in title was part of the the arrangement with the publisher and recognizing that this is a, a new edition of it but but i'm just curious about what that process was like too and what those discussions were <laughs> well you know I, it's funny because i i was still quite attached to no man stands alone but you know and the, the publisher felt that probably in this day and age it was uh, sort of a limiting gendered sounding title and um and i get that the the name no man stands alone actually comes from an old um hymn and it's um one of the lines is each man's joy is joy to me each man's grief is my own so that line from that hymn if you look at the at the whole the words from the entire hymn it's very much about um 
sharing the the path of life together with our fellow men, our fellow people, and so um, that that remains a you know a worthy title and context. But you know, none of us know hymns anymore. At that time, everybody probably knew that hymn. Everybody could hum a few bars when they saw the book title. Um, so you know, we we went round and round, and we we talked about some other possibilities. And then we were just looking at the chapter titles and went, you know, when when days are long, that's kind of a good. It sums up the life of a district nurse. You know, the day right. well long hell. Pardon me. Um, they're endless. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's not a long day. It's just one great continuous day, night, twenty four seven kind of existence. So when I when I put it into that kind of frame of mind, I went, yeah, you know, I can live with that. I can live with that. And certainly, again, bringing it back into um, the early days of the pandemic. Here, I thought I understand what this long days means. Time begins to warp. It's just uh, a matter of putting one foot in front of the other, and and so yeah, when days are long, it, it works. It works for sure. Uh, yeah, well. absolutely, it works. And yeah, sort of in this era right now where time doesn't really mean anything anymore, <laughs> at least to me. You know, I, I'm working at home, and you know, one day just flows into the other, and maybe people would say that maybe I'm not doing it in the right way, where you know. Tuesday, Saturday, like the, the day for me is the exact same. You know, I'm. I'm I know. You know? <laughs> or it, it's it's the seven hundredth day of March. It's yeah. the you know. Like, yeah. It it has no meaning, and of course we we can access information, well, for good, bad, or otherwise, at any time in the twenty four hour day. Yeah. There is no definitive day and night now in the north. In Amy's era um, of well, summer days were uh, were really long because yeah. <laughs> you didn't really get nighttime. Um, and in the winter, the day you had very very few hours in which to do your work. You one could one could um, function within their uh, a, the time was dictated by light in in her day. Now there's there's no limits on on how long the day is one just bleeds into another yeah. and um yeah, yeah especially now yeah. it's it just sort of the, the it comes and goes and you'd barely even notice or at least i i barely notice is sort of the sameness of of you know my my 10 foot commute uh so <laughs> certainly right yeah, yeah, that, that, that's how I... far it is now I know we all have our our ten foot commute. It's like, oh, am I going to be in the basement today, or am I going to be on the main floor? I, um, at least now I can go outside. But I, and I wonder too, what Amy would have, what her take would have been on all of this as a public health nurse if she were in the nur- in the north now. Um, what would she be experiencing? Yeah. And um, you know. This, I have a little side tale to tell you. I have, I have a friend whose daughter is working up in a northern community, say, a community that Amy visited often. And when we first got word of the impending pandemic getting, you know, reaching Canada and northern and, and BC, um, she had her mother making masks because she knew in this northern community there wasn't going to be a supply. Right. And we and then this is where I go how little things have changed and this is what Amy was advocating for when she went to the press and I I put this in the introduction of the book because I think it's really important when she went to the press and was and I'll put this in quotation marks then um resigned from her position um, but she was calling out the federal government for lack of support. And here we are, how many, you do the math, but we're how many years later, and we still have northern indigenous communities that don't have supplies that they need. We have dozens, if not hundreds, but I think it's dozens at, at last count, of communities, indigenous communities in our country on uh, boil water advisories or having water trucked in 
And, you know, what is the first thing the public health officials are telling us all to do? Wash your hands. And and we have communities without clean water. You know, like, <laughs> yeah. um, and I think, oh, Amy, oh, Amy, I'm so sorry we haven't come that much further in some respects. Yeah, and it's part of what the, why this book is relevant too at this moment is a lot of the stuff that she was seeing and, and advocating for still exists, and and certainly uh, that's why it's a relevant read in 2020. Not only because of the pandemic, but just generally, as you mentioned, the condition of the the uh, so many indigenous communities uh, across the country, and I think part of what's what's I guess cool is is not only is the book shining a light on that and and bringing it back again allows that to happen but also the royalties from the release are being donated to the gene goodwill scholarship from the canadian yes. indigenous nurses association so i, I think that's a, a really cool way to honor amy's life and, and legacy and you know what it's the only way in which i would have released the book it was it was a uh, because I wanted to do something in to honor Amy that wasn't achievable in her lifetime. One thing that, and this comes from letters that she would have that, uh, that she wrote to family and that she would write to her superiors with the government, saying, "What we need, what these people need, are nurses." in their own communities, nurses who understand the culture, who understand the language, who understand every aspect of life for these people. And so um, Jean Goodwill was an Indigenous nurse. I don't know if she was the one of the first in, in Canada, but um, she this scholarship that's set up in her name through the Canadian Indigenous Nurses Association um, does exactly that and, and supports Indigenous nurses in their training. And so that was sort of also part of the bargain with the publisher was, you know what, this book is in the public domain. None of us really have any rights to royalties for this book. And where royalties are needed, where royalties have value is in... Um, honoring Amy's spirit by supporting um, Indigenous nursing. That was just a deal breaker on on the book. Was making sure that if there was any any royalty revenue generated uh, in book sales, that it would get uh, channeled back into um, nursing education of, of Indigenous persons. Just um, it honors Amy and uh everything that she did you know in 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 her time in in the first release of the book and it allows us to um yeah like i say honor her support the nursing education and uh hopefully get more more um you know indigenous nurses into into communities and and helps us move forward as a as a as a society, yeah. Yeah, it's it's yeah certainly a wonderful gesture and, and a great idea to have have the royalties from the book go to that cause. As you say, it really fits with the whole tone of the book and what and what the book is trying to accomplish. So again, the book is "When the Days Are Long: Nurse in the North," written by Amy Wilson. And and just as a as a last question here, Laurel, what do you think people in 2020 when they come to the book, what do you think they'll get out of it? You know, it's, it's a book, obviously, that written you know, over 50 years ago, over 60 years ago, uh, or parts of it. What is it in 2020 that you think modern Canadian audiences will really, uh, will, will stand out to them as they read this? Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> well, Okay, I have to give you a three-pronged answer. I mean, okay. it, it, it's a charming book in terms of just its the style of writing. There's a, there's a certain colloquial kind of, mm, uh, 
certain acuteness to it. I mean, it, it's charming. Let's 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 just say that. So it's an easy read. But if you think between the lines, it's also um, kind of an astonishing read about about what um, what was what was accomplished and and what challenges were faced not only by Amy as the nurse but by the people living in the north at the time and then one would obviously ponder gee how is it different today is it different today what maybe they will ask can I do to um, better understand indigenous people so hopefully it inspires some questions um, and and yeah inspires people to to um, just conduct themselves with a little, little more heart and a little less judgment, and um, that would be my hope that the book in, inspires in people now. That they, and that's a, a wonderful sentiment, and I, I agree. I, I think the book will accomplish that. It, it is a, a wonderful read. I enjoy going through it. So again, when the days are long, Nurse in the North, by Amy Wilson and a introduction by Laurel Diedrich Maine. So, Laurel, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, thank you so much for the opportunity, Sean, and uh, to you and to everyone, stay well, stay healthy, and stay kind. So there you have it, my conversation with Laurel Diedrich Maine. My thanks to her for joining me all the way from Edmonton. And again, the title of the book is When Days Are Long, Nurse in the North, and as we mentioned, all royalties from the book are going to the Jean Goodwill Scholarship from the Canadian Indigenous Nurses Association. So that'll do it for this week's episode. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. If you have not yet, please do subscribe to the show, wherever it is you get your podcasts. Do the likes and the comments and the ratings. All that stuff helps other people find the show, helps us keep going here. And and head on over to Active History as well. A lot of great content over there over the past few weeks, pandemic-related, not pandemic-related, uh, so, some really well-written material over there. And, of course, feel free to go through the archive of this show as well. Some really wonderful stuff. I've, I've enjoyed talking to folks over the past few weeks about their projects. And so a, a lot of material out there that I think you'll enjoy if you liked this episode. So... If you have other things you would like to hear, please do get in touch, historyslam at gmail.com. You can also find me on Twitter at Dr. Shawnee Fever. So we'll be back with you next week for another new episode. But until then, if you're out and you see Enrico Palazzo, please say hi for him. Thanks for listening to the History Slam podcast. Be sure to check out Active History for more features, articles, and be sure to subscribe on iTunes.